Hi, Professor Gassimi here. In this component of the lecture, we'll be discussing neural networks. Now, many of the relationships in NLP are beyond the capabilities of simple sigmoids or linear functions to approximate. And up until now, we've sort of, a lot of our focus has been on things like logistic regression, which is obviously a compressed version of a linear function. So for example, consider this problem here where I have some data x, which represents the number of characters in some text. And I want to use this to predict whether a object is a tweet or not. So one here represents, yes, it's a tweet, and zero here represents, no, it's not a tweet. And these blue lines here, let's say, rep these blue points here represent data points um, in some training data set that I have. Well, it doesn't matter sort of how hard I try to fit a sigmoid to this. There's just no way to represent the relationship between x and y just because of the way a sigmoid is shaped, right? Now, if we wanted to solve this problem, though, there's a path we could take, which is to just write out a brand new model. And you might at first say, well, how should I write out a brand new model? And the way that you go about doing that is by thinking about the properties that you would need in that model and then trying to take advantage of existing objects that you're familiar with that might have some of those properties. So for example, we know that we're going to need a model that increases at some locations, as indicated by the red line here. We also know that the model will need to decrease in some locations, right? And then there's going to need to be some areas where it's flat. Well, those are all three sigmoid-like properties, right? So sigmoids have areas where they're flat, they have areas where they increase, and they have areas where they decrease. So maybe um, some combination of sigmoids, some linear combination of sigmoids, might help us solve this problem. Consider, for example, if I just had two sigmoids, let's say the yellow line here is sigma 2, the red line here is sigma 1. And each of these have their own sets of parameter values. So let's say this guy has m1 and b1, and this guy has m2 and b2. Well, I can tune the value of uh, m2 and b2 and m1 and b1 so that I place the sigmoids like this. And then if I took the difference between them, so that's the height here, so the difference between these two lines, sigma2 and sigma1, I would get something like what I'm showing with the green bars here, right? So you can see, for example, where sigma2 is the most different from sigma1, the green bar is the tallest, and as the difference between the two gets smaller, the green bars decrease. Okay, well, this sigma2 minus sigma1, what do you notice about it? Well, it kind of, not, not perfectly, but it kind of captures the relationship that we wanted, right, between x, which was the number of characters, and y, which was... Um, whether this was a tweet or not. You can see it sort of, you know, kind of the probability increases in the right area and then it, it decreases thereafter. And of course, it doesn't sort of hit exactly the point we want um, on the probability side. So one thing we might do is we might multiply sigma 2 by 2 so that we can kind of amplify this green signal. And this is a lot closer to what it is that we would want for our classification purpose, right? But there's a problem here that if I'm not careful with the way that I tune these weights, when I'm taking twice sigma 2 minus 1 sigma 1, I might come up with a situation where this green bar overshoots the, the y-axis. So I could get a value, for example, of y in my prediction, y hats to be specific, that is greater than 1. But these are probabilities, right? So I need a way to normalize those. And well, we already discussed in the previous lectures that very simple way to normalize things between two values is to just use another sigmoid. So that is to say that a simple thing I could do if I wanted to correct this is to take a sigmoid and then take a weighted combination of one sigmoid and another sigmoid, as you can see here, and this would give me a significantly more flexible function to approximate this relationship that we see here. Now, this idea of using simple functions, stacking simple functions together to create more complicated functions with greater amounts of flexibility to approximate relationships between x and y,
That is the intuition behind a neural network. That's all it is. Okay, so people oftentimes like to represent neural networks graphically, but the, the neural network graphical representation just makes it easier to sort of read than this, this long equation up here. So let's step through it together. We have a value x. That value x shows up as you can see up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass this value x into two sigmoid equations. Note that each of these sigmoid equations have a value m1, b1 in the case of sigma1, and then sigma2 might have m2 and b2 because they have these two parameters, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply those sigmoids by two weights that we choose, like we did in the example. Let's call them w1, w2. We're going to sum those and we're going to put it through another sigmoid so that we compress the value between 0 and 1 and we finally get, therefore, this equation for y hat up here as a function of x. And oftentimes it's easier to sort of look at a glance at, at this picture and, and understand what's going on than it is to sometimes look at a, a long equation, especially if we start adding, um, instead of a sigmoid of sigmoids, if we start going to a sigmoid of sigmoid of sigmoids, it can get very complicated to read very quickly. So in the context of neural networks, by the way, these sigmoids, the things that are doing the compression of values between 0 and 1, these are referred to as activation functions. And very critically, as we're going to discuss in some of the upcoming lectures, these don't have to just be sigmoids. They could be um, rectified linear units or any other kind of function that does the job of compressing the values between a range that's of interest to us. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a sigmoid. You could Make another, you can make your own function that compresses the values into a range that you're interested in. Now, each instance where an activation function occurs is typically referred to as a node. So in this case, because you know there's an activation function here and here and here, we would say that this has three nodes. And oftentimes, when we want to describe the properties of these networks, we will describe them in layers. So we will, for example, talk about the place where we pass in the data as the input layer. This is where the x was. And then we will describe the everything that's between this input layer and the output layer, which finally generated y hat, is called a middle layer, uh, a middle layer or a hidden layer. Okay, and we can increase the flexibility of the model to perform approximations that are more and more complicated in two ways. The first way is we just increase the number of nodes. So for example, if I was able to, in the previous example, um, approximate the function using two sigmoids, well, if I had access to three and I were taking a sum of the three sigmoids instead of just two, I could probably get that shape to work um, even better in terms of its match with uh, the data, correct? I mean, you can intuitively sort of see that that makes sense. And then another thing that you can do is also increase the number of layers here, which effectively gives you just more ways that you can bend the individual lines of those sigmoids to accomplish even more complicated functions that map between your input layer and your output layer. So these two ways, which are increasing the number of nodes and increasing the number of layers, are how you go about creating a function x that can map to an increasingly complicated outcome that you're interested in, y. Now this particular configuration of a neural network that I'm showing you here, which has uh, an input and a hidden layer, a hidden layer followed by an output, and notice that uh, each of the nodes are connected to all the other nodes, this is called a fully connected feedforward neural network. It's called fully connected again because each of the inputs here um, to a given node is always coming from all of the previous nodes from the previous layer. So what this means is that the sigmoid activations, for example, on this first hidden layer, I pass those to each of the functions in the next layer to be considered for my computational purposes. But there's nothing, by the way, that forces you to do that. I mean, these are just equations at the end of the day, we can write them however we want. We could, for example, decide we didn't want a fully connected neural network that, you know, we wanted this, this node here in the first hidden layer to pass its contents to these two nodes and the others to just pass their contents forward to an additional 
uh, activation function, we could also design it like that. And in fact, what you'll notice as you go through a lot of neural network literature is that these sorts of tricks, figuring out how you uh, change elements strategically of the connectivity structure, are things that might differentiate one kind of neural network topology from another. And um, OK, we understand what it means to be fully connected. Well, I also said that this was a feed-forward neural network. And it's a feed-forward network because notice that the connections here always move in the direction from the input layer to the output layer. They sort of The river flows one way, if you will, if we follow these arrows. But we don't have to do that, right? We could take the output of this layer, and we could, if we wanted to, connect it back as an input to be considered in this layer. That's also a possibility. When you do this sort of operation, it's typically referred to as a recurrent neural network. Um, and so I'm just highlighting this to you again, because although we'll be talking a little bit more about other neural network topologies in the upcoming lecture, I wanted to make it clear here that a lot of the differences that you will see in the neural network literature are really just describing different ways that you go about creating these connections or the way that you draw the connections between one layer and the next. OK, well, what do you notice about this model that we have here? Well, unlike the very simple logistic regression model, this is going to have a lot of weights, right? So for example, let's, let's think about each of the red objects as a sigmoid, and let's assume they each have two parameters. They have an m, and they have a b. So let's count the number of parameters that we would have in a model like this. Well, for each of them, we're going to have a b, right? That was the intercept in the y equals mx plus b that was part of the sigmoid. So we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different values of b that help us parameterize these. But then in terms of the other components, we're going to have as many additional parameters as there are basically arrows on the screen. Because for each of these relationships that get passed, we have to have a small weight that you know we can add to those bias terms, the B terms in these sigmoids, before summing them up, putting them through the sigmoid, and passing on to the next layer. So in addition to these seven parameters here, we're also going to have uh, an additional parameter for each of the arrows that you see. So all of that is to say that the number of parameters here is going to grow very quickly. And this is exactly the reason why you need an optimal way or an efficient way to optimize those parameter values, which is what gradient descent provided us, as we discussed in the last component of the lecture. Now, there's a very important thing I need to point out here about gradient descent when you're talking about nonlinear functions of x. You remember before we had this really beautiful smooth surface and we could sort of start anywhere in that surface, follow the gradient, and we always got to the optimal location of the values of m and b. Well, as soon as you start, as soon as you start thinking about um, nonlinear functions, the surface no longer smooth. It actually kind of looks, it kind of looks like what I've drawn here. They're sort of crazy looking. It's like a mountain range. And so the consequence of this is that if you start at this point and follow the gradients down, you might end up with a totally different setting of the parameter values than if you started at this point and followed um, the gradient down. What this means is that if I'm going to find different values of m and b, depending on where I start, that's necessarily going to impact the loss or the performance of my model, how well it fits. And so the practical consequence of this is that oftentimes you have to try many different initializations of the weights when you're doing gradient descent for neural networks. And of course, there's a whole field of research and techniques that try to come up with smarter gradient descent techniques tweaks to the gradient descent technique that will help you account for some of these, these kind of challenges of navigating a space like this. 